A Rady draft debate dates all the way back to 1948 when Ben-Gurion famously visited the home of the Chazanish. It continues to be perhaps the most contentious issue in Israeli politics, and of course it's something very close and near and dear to our hearts. Right now, Haredi leaders are facing an extremely difficult decision, and here to discuss all of that is the legendary Yankee Farber of Bechadre Haredim. Uh, Yankee, are, are you are you ready to enlist in the IDF right now? Well, um, I, I finished my... I, I think I finished my, my duty in the IDF for good. Okay. I am... Um, yeah, because, you know, I'm getting old. <laughs> and nah. So, um, <laughs> no, because there's a new generation anyway. So, um I think I'm finished with the idea if I did enough anyway. Okay, so tell us what's going on. I know you know a lot of the inside scoop, and we're on the brink here of a very big deadline. And there's talk that there's been a shift in Haredi leadership, and specifically that they're ready to possibly make a concession, possibly allow drafting in a, in the law uh, to for people, for Haredi who are not learning full-time in yeshiva. So is that actually uh, accurate? Well... It depends who you, who you ask. Basically, there is a three uh, rabbis um, that are actually leading the Haredi community uh, um, in Eretz Israel. We have Rabbi Moshe Yilel Hirsch, the Rosh Hashiva of Slavotka. We have uh, Rabbi Dov Lando, he's also Rosh Hashiva in, Slavo, in Slavotka Yeshiva. And then we have uh, Rabbi Meir Tzvi Bergman, he Rosh Hashiva in Ponovich. And all three together, they basically, um, you know, they sit down and decide uh, what's going to happen. Now, I know that there is basically machloikes um, aposkem. They're not really sure how to deal with uh, such a hot potato. But eventually, I believe they will uh, work out a solution between them and come out with something like in the middle. But the thing is, everybody agrees, you know, not to touch the, the yeshiva bochem. They, they won't really sit and learn all day. So that no, nobody talks about it. Even the Israeli government and even the people who demand all Haredim join the IDF, they know very well that um, the people that you're not allowed to touch or the, or the Yeshiva Bochem, the real one, you know, the one who's, who's sitting in uh, Yeshiva Smir, in Slabotka, in, in Hebron, or in or Israel, you know, in all these big Yeshivas. So, Panovich, of course. So, I don't... I, so, basically, nobody's going to touch them, but the, the talk is about all the other boys, you know, the one who are not learning. And they are registered as Yeshiva Bochrem, you know, but they're not really learning, they're working. Some of them are in especially Yeshivas to keep them off the street, but they're not really off the street. I mean, I, I see many of them, um, I don't know by numbers, uh, but as far as we know, the people who are dealing with them, there is thousands of uh, boys uh, between age 16, 17 till 20, 22, 21 that are not learning and they are, um, they're not, they're not so, you know, some of them don't even look Haredim. Uh, they, they, they dress like non Haredim. They just have a little kippah, but they're not really Haredim. So I, I spoke I, to one of the rabbis in, in, uh, in Israel, big rabbi. Uh, I prefer not to mention his name. He said to me, the boys that were not learning and they are not going to the IDF, they don't join the IDF, they, he said, I'm not saying they have a Dean Roydef, you know, the one who actually make, uh, um, uh, they actually, um, you know, damage the Shiva Bokhre because, but these boys must go to the IDF. Because of them, the real Bokhre cannot uh, stay in Shiva. Everybody wants them also to join the IDF and we've got to make sure that um, all those boys will join the IDF. But the other side, we have uh, other rabbis like, um, um, again, Ramon Shil Elir, Shabdov Lando, and also the Vizhnitzer Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe. And they say, they didn't say it, but um, this this is what the people talk that uh, are behind the rabbis. And, you know, um, they usually speak out for the rabbis. They said that if... We're going to give permission officially for the boys that are on the street to join the IDF. We're going to have tomorrow or in two weeks' time over 5,000 young um, boys who they all come from Haredi families dressed to his IDF uniform all over Jewish, uh, all, all over Haredi neighborhoods in Jerusalem, 
הנה, בני ברק, ביתר, אלעד, קריית ספר, you know, all the way cities, and then what's gonna happen? It's, they just said that all the boys that were in good yeshivas are going to see that, well, there is permission for everybody to join the IDF if he's not learning so much. So they're going to leave yeshiva and also join the IDF. So basically they said thousands of other boys will join the IDF who could stay in yeshiva. But because there is a, a, the permission for everyone, so they will join. And this is a very big danger for the Haredi community. They are very worried that, you know, when you go to the IDF, um, you get different opinions. You start to knowing other communities. You get involved in um, things that you haven't been uh, got involved before. Even uh, you are uh, um, Haredi. You start to knowing the world, as we say. And they're very worried that um, people will actually, um, you know, I'm not going to say become a, a secular, no, become Chiloini, but it will, they will uh, maybe change the clothes, change their opinions, and they're very worried about yeah, it. Yeah, it's a danger. No, the, we all understand the danger. I want to just uh, interject. This is fascinating, and there's a lot to unpack. But this issue you're raising, uh, that the Rabbanim are worried that, yes, maybe it, it, it's understandable for the ones who are not learning or the ones who are on the street to join the IDF. Maybe it's even a good thing for them, but that's going to then... Uh, appeal to others, drag in others who say, oh, wow, that's an option. That's a new issue, right? In other words, 25, 30 years ago, the, the, the Gedolim of Shach, their concern was the drafting into the IDF. Their concern was that if you allow the government in, the government's going to, you know, drag all these boys in and force them. Now you're saying that even if it's voluntary, we're concerned that 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 the boys, the Bakram, are going to voluntarily go and leave Yeshiva, right? Yes, and this is something that you're very worried about. But, and and, you know, the thing is that um, till now, everybody knew, okay, you joined the IDF. Well, it's because he couldn't stay in yeshiva. It's because he couldn't, he didn't do well. And and he had no choice. And, you know, I, I was in Netzach uh, Yehuda, you know, the Haredi unit. You know, I saw boys who came from the streets. They didn't keep anything before they joined the IDF. They didn't keep anything, not Shabbos and not, nothing. Nothing. And they, they didn't even dress like Haredi. When they joined the IDF, they were forced to daven Shachas Min Chemarev. They were forced to keep Shabbos. They were forced to stay uh, every day and listen to a shir, a Torah shir. So why? Because this is part of uh, the unit. So they did it because, you know, they've been forced. But eventually they realized that it's not so bad to daven. It's not so bad to keep Shabbos. It's not so bad to listen to a, a shir. And eventually they changed because in the IDF, obviously it was done in a very nice way. So people joined, people became much better. So many, many, many uh, Haredi leaders who will not say this in public, say that the idea, all those Haredi units, they helped all those boys on the streets. But again, they are very worried that uh, it would open like a wide door and many, many people will join boys that could stay in yeshiva. In my opinion, this is what I think, but again, I am das mute, you know, I think I'm the only one who keeps writing about it. There will never, ever be permission, officially permission, from the rabbis, no matter who, to join the IDF. Never. That's my opinion, because I say that um, to give such a permission, you really need to have a you need to you need to do a massive massive change in the Haredi community I don't see it uh, happening because also there is machloikis between the Gedoilim so uh, we don't really know I don't see how it's going to work uh, but maybe they will give you know permission under the table I, I really don't know how it's going to end but the Haredi community is like um, as we say when you drive you get to a dead end you must find yourself use of a way out you have to make a u-turn and and, and and if and if the car is too big you have to leave the car and start walking back by yourself <laughs> this is where i see it the idf the Haredi community must come to a solution in the next few weeks because if not the government will stop funding yeshivas because officially the boys must join the idf and if you must join the idf it's impossible according to the law to give money to a yeshiva that this boy is supposed to go to the idf so the so the government said, you know, if you come with us with a solution, 
or maybe even start a solution, we will keep founding the yeshivas till June. And then on June, we're going to make sure you have to have a, a, there, is, there should be a solution. There should be maybe a new law or something. I, I don't see how it's going to work. I think it's just going to schlep it and another month, another month, till something is going to blow up. Uh, I really don't know how it's going to end. Wow. Now, let me ask you a couple of things. Number one, you mentioned the three, Gidai the Rosh Yeshiva, of course. Now, do you know, you're saying even amongst them, there's a disagreement. Do you know who holds what and which one is the most in favor of possibly sending uh, Haredi Bakram, non-learning Bakram to the IDF? Um, so, Reb Dov Lando um, said many times, whatever Moishe Hillel said, he accepts and um, he knows that Moishe Hillel will say the right thing. Uh, Reb Meir Tzvi Bergman has a, is a little bit more uh, strict He's like, um, okay, uh, maybe we have to let the boys actually join the IDF because we need to make sure that the government will keep founding yeshivas, but we're not going to make it in public. Well, nobody really knows what uh, the agreement is, but basically all three agreed together that the way that it's been done till now, it's impossible. It's impossible for it. To be done. It's impossible yeah. for it to keep to keep going the same way. And I want to ask you about that because that's the reports that I'm seeing is that they they recognize there's some kind of tzorech, not that they're happy about it, but that there needs to be sort of a concession that's not ne really never been made before, where they say, okay, we're allowing quotas to be drafted. So what? Why is that? Is that because of the war? Is that because they've just met the deadline? It's been literally 25, 30 years. The Tal law and so many different things that have been kicked down the road and again and again. So what is it about now that made this, I guess, major earth-shattering shift? Well, there is two answers for it. One, the war, as you said. People in Israel keep dying. If it's soldiers, if it's civilians in terror attacks. Yesterday, there was a 50-year-old man. He was actually an IDF guy. He was killed in a terror attack not far from Be'er Sheva. Soldiers keep dying all the time. In the north, Hezbollah keeps shooting non-stop rockets. So this is going to be a long war. And people know that the Israeli society knows that people are actually fighting for the home. You know, in America, you never, you, you don't have a border that somebody wants to invent in New York and come and kill everybody in their beds. Here in Israel, Hamas, it used to be like, you know, 300 meters, 500 meters from the house. So people know it's completely different than, than what happened till now. And another reason is that many people, okay, like uh, Bezalel Smotrich, he's the finance minister now, or uh, Simcha Rotman, and some other uh, Knesset members that were always on the Haredi side, they always said, we are not touching the Haredi community, said, um, well, our uh, love Haredi uh, families, brothers and sisters, whatever, we need you. We want you to join the IDF. You must join the IDF. So when you have people like Smotrich, who always support the Haredi side, saying, we need you. There is a, a limit how much we can still uh, keep, uh, you know, working like that, that the Haredi will not join the IDF. This time, we need you. So when you have people who always supported you, calling you out to join the IDF, everybody understands there must be a change. And other, more than that, this is the first time since I remember myself, and I'm 44, that the that actually IDF called out for the Haredi to join. It was the chief of staff, the IDF, it was the minister of defense, it was some other ministers, and you know something? Many lefties, Many lefty leaders, all different leaders from the left, who never ever called out for, to join the Haredi to join the IDF, because then everybody's going to ask, okay, what about the Israeli Arabs? Why are they not going to join? Even everybody knows that it's impossible to. Uh, nobody really wants the Israeli Arabs in the IDF, but um, so they never spoke about it. In the last two months, there is non-stop talking about the Haredi to join the IDF from the left, from the right, from the center, from all over. So basically, the Haredi are 
under pressure that like they've never been before right. since 1940 since 1948 it's unbelievable how Akash Baruch has created you know a lot of that that yeah we've never seen now you made a few points before that are absolutely fascinating that I've never really heard from anyone else and I think you have a better understanding insight into this than almost anybody because of who you are and because of you know your surroundings you said that number one a rav told you that the Bakram who are not who are officially in yeshiva but not really learning in yeshiva they're actually almost a right if you said they're causing problems yeah, you, for you can see else. them you can see them you can see them on a machne yehuda market every evening and especially on thursday evening sure. when you go on thursday evening uh, like around 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the night uh, israel, israel time of course you see thousands of them walking around doing nothing with a smartphone um and um, i don't know with a smartphone or as we say in america cell phone and they wear jeans, they wear T-shirts, they have a little tiny couple, and you ask yourself, what? Well, how are they Haredi? And those boys are in yeshiva. And why are and they causing so many all... problems? Can you explain that? As, as again, I'm saying, most of the, the Haredi were very worried that we, if, they, if we're going to let those boys to join officially the IDF, many, many other boys from good yeshivas were not necessarily um, happy being in yeshiva, but they're there in yeshiva because everybody's in yeshiva. They will leave yeshiva, and they're said, very worried about it. Which is fast, which is a, obviously a grave concern. And then, but there's a flip side that you said, which is that some boys will actually be benefiting from going there because they're maybe at risk. And if they go there, that's a sviva where they can maybe be more turned on to Yiddishkeit than they are right now. So there's like literally yeah. both sides of double-edged sword. And I so I, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. I'm not sure that um, the Haredi rabbis, or all the Haredi leaders, will not really, well, there's, we, have to, we have to make a, you know, they're separate. We have the Knesset members, all the all the Havri Knesset, you know, like Gafni and Maklev and Eichlev, and all those people who represent the Haredi in the Knesset. And we have the rabbis, of course. So the Knesset members, nobody, um, with all the respect, we have them and we do. Nobody really asks them. They nobody cares what they say. Nobody cares what their opinion. Because at the end of the day, they listen to the rabbis. And if the rabbis will tell them, you have to do this, you have to do that, they will do it, even if they don't like it. Now, they don't talk. They don't talk to the media. Every Israeli channel, every Israeli radio station, website, wants to speak to the Haredi MKs. They don't talk. None of them, not from uh, Yaduta Torah, United Torah Judaism, and not from Shas. Because... They say in like um, you know private uh, calls. They say we don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to. We don't want to make all the lefties, all the secular, all the non haredi people crazy, because they're very worried that so many of people will just go marching on the streets. And they said it. Many uh, non haredi organizations said we're going to demonstrate. We're going to. They, 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 they literally said we're going to turn over Israel. To make sure that the Haredim will join the IDF. No more money to yeshivas, no more money to schools who don't teach education. It's all those things are finished. Now, the IDF said by itself that they need more soldiers. Uh, one second, please. <laughs> uh, well, well, you know something? Um, I'll give you numbers. Everybody knows that it's not a secret. Over 600 IDF soldiers were killed since 7th of October. Probably like 3,200, maybe more, were injured in a way that they, they will never be able to, get, to go back to the units to fight again. So you have 4,000 soldiers that will not be able to fight. Some of them were dead, some of them were injured. So obviously they said we need a Haredim. And you know, by numbers, you can easily replace them with all those boys who are not learning in yeshiva or just on the streets. So till now, they could stay on the streets. From now, I don't think it's possible for them to, do, to stay on the streets. But in the other hand, I don't see how it's going to happen that all of them are going to join the IDF. I now, really don't know. Yeah. Now let's say they did agree to some kind of quota and they did agree to the non-learning Bakrim to join, do they need to actually serve as soldiers? Or uh, I saw reports that they can join Hatzalah, that they can join other units that are non-combat units. 
Well, they talk about it, that the boys could uh, choose whoever they want to go, or maybe the IDF will choose whoever they, they need them. But it's not, uh, yeah, they can maybe join, you know, the police. They don't have to go to the IDF, they can join the police, they can join a community service, they can join, as you said, the Ichud Atzolet, they can join MADA, they can join ZAKA. Um, you know, in America, we, you have Chesed Shalemeth or Mitzaskim, so in Israel we have ZAKA, and they can join, but that's not the, that's not the big uh, thing about it, because it's not if you go to the IDF or you go to ZAKA or Ichud Atzolet, it's that the government will actually be in charge of all those boys who are on the streets, and if a boy that will say one day will wake up in the morning and say, I don't want to be in Shiva, it's too, it's too hard for me. Well, let's join the IDF. It will be much easier for him to do it with support of the Rabonim, support of the community, support of the family. This is something that never ha- happened before. Right. Um, you know, today when, when a Haredi boy joins the IDF, he's different than everybody. So people know he's different. But now if it's going to be a Roshus to join the IDF or any other organization, People will uh, say, whoa, we are happy with it, and it's normal, it's okay, and this is what the rabbi is very worried about. Right, I mean, it'll become mainstream, or at least it won't be the stigma that it is. Let's say... Yes, it won't be the stigma that it is. Right, you want to keep the stigma. I can totally understand that, even if you personally think somebody belongs there. Uh, let's say the Rabbanim would all, let's say all three Rabbanim would get up and agree and say, we have no choice. Let's just theoretically say, and they would agree to quotas for non-learning Bachrim. Um, putting aside the, the fears about other people learning, but would there be a concern or revolt? Would, would there be groups of Haredim in the community who say, no, we cannot accept this and w- would have issues with, even if the Rosh Yeshiva, or if the Rosh Yeshiva say it, do you think it'll be unanimously agreed to? No, there will definitely be like a group or two that will go against to it. Well, there is always, you know, in, in, we have in the history, in the Jewish history, there was always a Koirach Ve'adosoi, there were always Dosan and Avirom. There were always people who spoke against to the rabbis and said that the rabbis are too old. They don't know what they're saying. And people tell them what to say, all those of things. People said it about the Chofetz Chaim. There is a, um, a, there is a known story that the Chofetz Chaim, when he was very old, people said, well, he doesn't know exactly what's going on around yeah. him. And he spoke against to those people. He said, I know very well what's going yeah. on around me. So there will be definitely people um, that will go against it, if it's the Pelega Yerushalmi, if it's some other uh, people, but um, nobody really cares about them. They're not big enough, and you know something, the Pelega Yerushalmi, when they started going against to uh, Rab- Rabbi Steyman and some other rabbis, people thought they're going to be big, but you know, every Machloikis, that's my opinion, every Machloikis that it's not Hashem Shomayim doesn't last. So since uh, Rabbi Shmuel Eurbach, where he was the leader of the Pelega Yerushalmi, since, since he was Nifter, the Pelega Yerushalmi are divided for, th- for three, okay? We call them a Peleg Shev Vesoy Ha Peleg. Um, we have one in Ashdod, one in Bnei Brak, one and another group in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. And we call them a Peleg Shev Vesoy Ha Peleg Shev Vesoy Ha Peleg because they were like three and they don't get on with each other. Because their machloikis wasn't the Shem Shomai. And, and it was funny because like two weeks ago, maybe a few a few days ago, um, some of the Peleg blocked a, a road yeah. a four in Bnei Brak, and they blocked also the entrance to the road, Jerusalem. So it was so funny to hear that another Peleg group, like from Jerusalem, said, well, it has nothing to do with us. It's the other Peleg. So there will definitely be people that will go against it. But I don't think their opinion will be heard, and nobody really cares what they're going to say. Right. Okay, now let's talk about the politics, as you mentioned before. Uh, what What are the chances? Let's say you say that it's not going to happen. You say that there's not going to be an, a public official agreement where they put their stempel on and they say that quotas are allowed. If that happens, does that mean the yeshivas are in danger? Does that mean the, the coalition falls apart? If, if you're right, then what's, how's it going to play out? So, so... What I think is going to play out, they're going to schlep it for another few months. Well, how are they going to do it? It's very easy. They're going to say, okay, you know what? We're coming for a solution. We'll give you 5,000 boys every year. There is plenty of boys who are not in yeshiva. All those boys are going to join the IDF. We're going to force them to join the IDF. So um, they're going to schlep it till June, uh, April, May, June. Yeah, another three, two, three months. And in the meantime, we're going to work something out with, uh, the, non, with, the, non, with the non-Haredi parties, like uh, uh, Benny Gantz, and uh, who else do we have? Gidon Saar, and 
maybe let's... Uh, I'm not sure about Yair Lapid. He's in the opposition. But no, nobody really cares what his opinion is, what he says. Um, they will come with, a, with some solution and try to slap it another few months. But if, um, let's say, Benny Gantz will um, demand the Haredim to do more, so maybe they will, you know, leave the government. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't see it happening because the Haredim will not get better than what they have now um, in a different government. So, and the, and also they say that if there will be a new government, who said the Haredim will be in the new government? Maybe it will be a liberal government with 75 Knesset members without the Haredim, and they're going to put every law they want, and the Haredim will be out. So. They're going to schlep it for the next few months. This is the real answer. And try to find some solution that everybody should be happy with. You don't think Benny Gantz is going to make some kind of offer to the Haredim and say, let's make a draft exemption and well, well you, you come over to my side? And form no, a because, no, because the people who vote for Benny Gantz, the people who support Benny Gantz, like the people on the street, you know, the, 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 the secular community, they will go mad with him. And he knows it. And he has a lot of pressure from them not to give up for the Haredi this time. And you know what? If the Haredi will say the people are not learning, join the IDF, tons of them will be tons of them will be very happy to do it. So, and and those numbers will be enough. And the Shiva Bokhem could carry on learning, and the Shiva will, will get founded by, by the government. Because the thing is, you know, it's so different between America and Israel and Europe. In, in America, the government doesn't found yeshivas. Um, Unless they have, I'm not talking about yeshiva university. I'm talking proper yeshivas, sure. like they learn they learn Gemara all day and all this. Only in Israel, the government founds yeshivas. So if the government will not fund yeshivas, yeshiva will not be able to stay. And the nations and and you know fees that parents pay is not enough. Every yeshiva must have the support of the government. If there's no support of the government, yeshiva will close down. So you don't think, bottom line, you think, and you say maybe you're Daz Yachid, you think that they will be able to basically avoid making any concession and they'll be able to really avoid any sort of quotas and they'll, like you said, yes. they'll, they'll make promises. That would, be, Hashem, that would be the best possible outcome. I think they're going to schlep it um, from, I don't know, as much as they can. As they've been doing I, for I really 25 don't... years. No, but this time it's very hard because this time, right. so so far, only the Supreme Court, Bagats, as we call it here, the Supreme Court, they always said, well, it's not fair. Why are the Haredim not joining the IDF? And why are the, only the secular people join the IDF? What about the Haredim? But there wasn't pressure from the streets. There wasn't pressure from the lefties. There wasn't pressure from the uh, liberal communities. There wasn't pressure from anybody. So, so they slept it another year, another, another year, another few months. We'll find this solution, that solution. But now it's not the government. It's not uh, the Supreme Court. It's the streets that demand the Haredim to join the IDF. And also, the IDF itself, you know, as I said, this is the first time since 1948 that the IDF actually comes to the rabbis. They say on TV, uh, uh, you know, like 8 o'clock in the evening, Israel time, this is the strongest time on the news. All TVs and all channels and all websites, they all have the um, stories exclusive. We cover this, we have this information, that information. They all say, they sit in, in the studios, and they say, Haredi community, we love you. Please join the IDF, we need you. We have not enough soldiers to fight Hezbollah. So the Haredi were like under pressure and in a situation that they have never, ever been before since Israel was established. And there was massive numbers. Do you know how many boys were actually registered? Not boys, also Koilil guys, that probably very, you know, old in, too old to join the IDF. But do you know how many people got those uh, permission not to join the IDF because they're officially learning, almost 70, 70,000. And those are numbers that everybody knows. It's officially numbers that the government uh, announced. Like 68,000 people. And they say, well, I'm sorry. It's impossible. It's impossible that all of them are learning. Great point. Great so, point. Yeah. Now, before so I, I, go, I, I don't know how it's going to end. I mean, no, nobody does. And it's really very scary. Before I let you go, any other thoughts on this? I have one other separate question, but any other thoughts on this topic first? We've covered but, it all. Um, no, I think we covered it all. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, and you'll give, keep us updated in the coming minutes, the coming days and weeks. Yeah, uh, it, 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 Sunday, Sunday, there's a meeting and, and, and the day after. But, you know, let's say if Hezbollah 
will start a proper war with Israel. So again, there will be changes. There will be much more pressure on, on the Israelis, um, um, you know, on Israel to, uh, on, on the Haredi community to join the IDF. So, uh, but let's say for now, there is enough pressure on the Haredi community from all sides, especially from people who supported the Haredi community all the time and said, let's not touch the boys that are in Yeshiva, even the boys that are not learning because we have enough soldiers, it's okay, we don't need all of them, so let them keep learning. But now people who are very friendly with the Haredi said, I'm sorry, I protected you, I was on your side, I helped you, we finished. Now he needed to join us, so... Yeah, I don't know how it's going to happen. It's an unprecedented time, like we've never seen an unprecedented matzav and a difficult matzav. Very fair. Uh, on a separate note, I have to ask you before I let you go, Senator Chuck Schumer, of course, made comments, disgraceful comments, basically equated Bibi Netanyahu and Hamas said Bibi Netanyahu is, is, is an obstacle to peace. Uh, the Democrats in general, President Biden has turned on Israel. He's pressuring, putting enormous pressure for them not to invade Rafa. And of course, they need to invade Rafa. That's the only option. So tell us uh, what your thoughts are on what the Israeli... Uh, opinion is these days of the Democrats? You know, I think, and everybody says it also here, but what I know from the American politics that the Democrats, they don't know what they're talking about, the Palestinians. They think that most of the Palestinians are nice people and they want to live peacefully with, with the Israelis and um, that if we, we have to give them a state and all those uh, things. The American government, the Democrats, they have no idea what the Israelis think about the Palestinians. If they would come to Israel, you know, like they spoke, let's Biden, you know, I saw, I think, I don't remember, or maybe of a political, maybe New York Times, Washington Post, I don't remember who, that Biden, President Biden, wants to come to Israel and speak with the Israelis behind the back of uh, Netanyahu. He wants to speak in the Knesset and tell the Israelis about the future. He doesn't know that 80% of the Israelis are against the Palestinians or against a Palestinian state. So I'm saying the American government have no, they haven't learned anything in the last 50 years about the Middle East. They haven't learned it. The Republicans do know a bit better. Now, I don't know, maybe if you ask uh, Schumer, Chuck Schumer, like, you know, in four eyes, you really think the Palestinians want to join, want peace? And if there will be a Palestinian state and everything will be fine? He would probably tell you, no, I think they're all a bunch of killers and murderers. But he has so much pressure. It's funny, you know, the Haredi map pressure in Israel to join the IDF. The Democrats have pressure in America to stop helping Israel um, from their people. So and, you know, many, oh, yeah. many, many Muslims say Immense that they're not going to vote for Biden. They're not going to vote for Biden because he helps Israel. So Biden is really under pressure from his own people, from his own government, from his own, actually, probably the people who are actually around them all day to stop founding Israel or whatever. So yeah. I can understand where it comes from. And Schumer is funny because he knows exactly. Israel. He was in Israel when the war started to come to support Israel, and all of a sudden he changed his mind. Probably, you know, as we said, the polls. You know, he knows that um, they are, they are very they under danger to lose the government for Donald Trump. So they say whatever they can to try to stop it, but I don't think it's going to help him. Yeah, the polls, a lot of the donors. The, the, yeah, the, the way he looks now, the way he looks now, Donald Trump will win uh, the government. Okay, let's hope, but we still have a long way to go. Things change. Yeah, we still have a long but, way. But, yeah, but, things uh, we, can change. We never know what's going to change. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. It's looking, it's looking much better than anybody ever thought it would a year or two ago. And uh, yeah, and and Biden being a terrible president uh, hasn't helped them one bit. And uh, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, we should, and, and now Biden gives uh, Iran another ten billion dollars. They announced they're doing the sanction waivers that they're renewing. He keeps giving Iran more and more billions. They're holding American hostages right now. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, I I don't understand what this government is doing, really. I mean, they are very, look, they do support Israel, we have to say it. They, people don't realize they give amount of tons of bombs and weapons and tanks and, 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 and so, you know how many planes land in Israel every day from the uh, from the US with weapons and everything? So yeah. maybe they're doing it just in the public, you know, to calm down the Arabs. I don't know, but um, what I, like, bottom line, Democrats, I have no idea about the Middle East. We saw in Obama's really? time, we oh. saw in Obama's time, we saw in Biden's oh. time, wars, the Middle East is burning all over. When Trump was president, was quiet. You didn't hear a noise from North Korea. I mean, maybe a year after, but I mean, in the beginning you did, you know, they were uh, threatening to kill each other. But uh, after that, you, uh, Trump realized that he has to be friendly with uh, North Korea. He started being friendly and was quiet. 
No North Korea threatening, no Middle East threatening, no Ukraine-Russian war, no Chinese-Taiwan, um, whatever. Since Biden became president, the Middle East is burning and the world is burning. Absolutely. Okay, we'll leave it there. By the way, I don't know when you sleep because I texted you, you know, uh, it was 1 a.m. your time and you gave me a thumbs up. Maybe you texted your sleep and then now it's basically 6.30 in the morning Israel time. Earlier, we It's 7 o'clock. Yeah, uh, and, I, and, uh, I, uh, I, yeah, I sleep yeah. I sleep on Shabbos, you know, we have Shabbos <laughs> so we can sleep. <laughs> yeah, okay, I love you. No, it's and, okay. Uh, you really, you're an Ehrlich, Thank you. very, very wonderful, special person. I really, really mean that. And I Thank appreciate you. you sharing all of this and uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep in touch. Yankee Farber, legendary yeah. journalist. Bechadrich Haredim on the VIN podcast.